John Kasich in New Hampshire, and Richard Cordray takes on Dennis Kucinich. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jackie Borchard, State House reporter for Cleveland.com. Andy Chow, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio. Dale Butland, Democratic strategist. And Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist. 22 months before the nation's first presidential primary, John Kasich drew a fair amount of attention in New Hampshire this week. He drew a decent sized crowd and a number of TV cameras to a fireside chat at a small New Hampshire college. The question that's on everyone's mind, Governor Kasich, are you running for president? That's like Dan Rather asking Teddy Kennedy, why do you want to be president, right? And he froze, and that was the end of it. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm trying to be the best governor, and I'm trying to be a voice that brings about stability and objectivity in our country and unifying. Well, I got a duck, do you believe him when he says, I don't know what I'm going to do? I don't. I don't mean that negatively, but I don't believe him. I don't think anyone around this table does. But let's face it, uh, Kasich enjoys being consequential. Um, he was able to drag CNN and a pack of reporters to New Hampshire on an off-year election and focus on him. I mean, he thrives for the TV. He said so in the New York Times. It's all about the TV, and I need the exposure. But quick history lesson. Look, Donald Trump won New Hampshire by 20 points. A recent University of New Hampshire poll that came out, credible poll, has Trump with 60% vote in 2020. So the deck's going to be stacked against against governor if he chooses that path to run in 2020. But, um, you know, he's out there. I've always said, I've said on your show before that, you know, I, I would respectfully ask the governor to come back to Ohio. He's a great CEO. He's a great governor. And we need him here to tackle some issues. Dale, in New Hampshire, the governor told the Concord Monitor editorial board that he's hanging around the basket yeah. waiting for the rebound <laughs> in case somebody misses. Is that what, is that what it's going to take for him to, to be a legitimate contender for the GOP primary is if for Donald Trump to miss, to fail? Yeah, look, he knows that his party is staring down the barrel of a Category 5 hurricane this November, and he obviously thinks that he can be the beneficiary. I would say, interestingly enough, there have been three polls in the last week that indicate he might be right. There are two national polls. One was Gallup, the other was Pew that showed while Trump has 80 percent of the Republican base, the percentage of people identifying as Republicans has shrunk by two points uh, since, or, or yeah, by two to three points since 2016. The number of people identifying it as Democrats has increased by two points, like a five-point shift. Um, and then there's this new poll out of New Hampshire that shows in a matchup between Kasich and Trump, uh, Trump's only got a six-point lead. Now, I'm not going to make a lot out of one poll, but the point is Trump's stranglehold on the base may not be as much as anybody thinks, and if the party gets shellacked this fall and if Trump is badly damaged by the Mueller investigation, someone like John Kasich could start looking pretty good. Jackie, the reporters in New Hampshire got a kick out of his quoting philosophers, the governor's quoting philosophers, which we saw at the State of the State Address and his cerebral tone. Uh, he's carrying that message around the country now. That's right. Uh, it seems, you know, there is definitely a difference between how Ohio reporters are viewing the governor's travels and bipartisan escapades in the national media. And uh, it has been interesting as an Ohio reporter to kind of watch the, the attention that he's getting on the national stage. Uh, but I think it's important that, you know, we're looking at polls here in, in tw early, you know, what, April 2018. There's a lot of time between 2020. There's a lot of variables. You know, Dale named two of them, but it, but who knows what could happen to Donald Trump? What could happen to the Democratic Party? I think uh, within the past week, Kasich has at least ruled out an independent bid. That seems to be kind of a, mm -hmm. a you know, leap off a cliff into a, a deep ocean, if you will. But uh, but definitely that path. It's a very, very narrow path, dependent on way too many outside factors to say at this point. So many outside factors, like, and right, a narrow path. What Mike said about uh, Donald Trump winning by 20 points, that was with a lot of other people in the field. So I think that one of the big indicators, like Jackie's talking about, is are there going to be a lot of challengers in that Republican field? If it is just John Kasich and Donald Trump going after the uh, Republican nomination, could that be uh, a big battle brewing between uh, on a, in a one-on-one -on -one, um, battle? Jeff Flake, Mike is the other name. He's actually visited New Hampshire, the Arizona Senate, outgoing critic of Trump. Um, 
he's 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 barely showing up in the Hampshire polls, but he's he's only spent a few times there. Yeah, he's out there, and, and you know, and there may be a primary in 2020 and the Republican side, but at the end of the day, it costs a lot of money to run. And where is John Kasich, Jeff Flake, or anyone else that is going to challenge the president of the United States going to find money to run a credible campaign? It's not going to be there. Dad, what about this unifier message? Um, I mean, here's an anecdote. John Kasich was at the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me event this week in Columbus, you know, primarily a left-leaning audience, I would say, but he got a warm reception. Um, is that, does he have some, is there some credibility to that unifier message? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, timing is everything in politics, actually in life, but especially in politics. Last time around, Kasich was running as the voice of experience and the voice of moderation in a year when the Republican base wasn't interested in either of those. By 2020, it could be a very different story, again, depending on, as Jackie says, all the things that happen between now and then. But if the Republicans look like they're in trouble, if there is a huge blue wave this year, they take, if the Democrats take back the House, possibly the Senate, that's harder, but if they do, and if Trump is badly damaged by this Mueller investigation, then I think anything's possible. Well, and are the Republicans going to want to vote in their Republican primary for the unifier right. message? Mm -hmm. If Donald Trump keeps doing things that the Republican base wants him to do, They've, you know, so far had no problem looking the other way on some of the other more scandalous things to support him. I think it's always important to know, like Mike did earlier, that that President Trump is very popular still among Republicans, even though if you see national polls and national approval ratings, he's still very popular, especially in Ohio among Republicans. Yeah, great point. The stock market is up overall since he became president, but it's down recently yeah, because well, of the trade issues. So yeah, we'll right. see which way it ends up. We do have 22 months to go before the first <laughs> vote is cast. <laughs> The two frontrunners, speaking of a vote that's closer to now, the two frontrunners in the Democratic primary for governor went at it this week. All four Democrats for governor met with the Cleveland Plain Dealer editorial board, but Dennis Kucinich and Richard Cordray largely focused on each other during the session. Cordray recalled how Cleveland went bankrupt while Kucinich was its mayor. Kucinich accused Cordray of abandoning his post when he resigned as director of the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. What you've done exactly is hand over to the Trump administration the keys to the Consumer Finance Protection Board with devastating effect for working class people in neighborhoods like where I live and for poor people. There are five payday lenders who have cheated millions of people out of billions of dollars and they're now running loose because Mr. Cordray deserted his post. I finished that payday lending rule before I left, and I was late into this race because I felt bound and determined and conscientiously obligated to finish that rule and make it law of the land, which it is now. But when you were in the General Assembly, you voted for the initial law that created payday lending in Ohio. So now to talk about how you're going to defend us against payday lending and the five payday lenders that exploit people in your community, they never would have gotten started if you hadn't voted for that law in the first place. Jackie Borchardt, it's apparent that these two folks think it's a two-person race, two-man race, uh, between, with the way they acted in this editorial board meeting. Well, I mean, the latest and really only third-party poll that, that we have shows them in a, a dead heat, but with a huge chunk of Democratic voters that say they're not yet decided. And, you know, early voting starts Tuesday. Uh, so, you know, now is the time for these campaigns to be heating up. And this week in the editorial board meeting, that's, I think, the most sparks that we've seen fly so far. You know, to date, the Democratic party has held several debates and you know they've been pretty friendly there's been some light jabbing but you know pretty friendly and i think that maybe you know both are now seeing it, it, we need to really define ourselves differentiate ourselves uh you know for the primary voters and it was it was nice to see the two candidates going head to head with the issues you know the press release battle goes back and forth right. little twitter wars go back and forth but it was nice to see all four especially those two address each other head on yeah, and I think what we're seeing everything come to a head on is that I think they were trying to uh, not attack each other that much. I think they were trying to be cordial among each other. But now when we're getting to the nitty gritty, there are these sticking points for both candidates. And I think if you really were to look at Dennis Kucinich and Rich Cordray, yes, they're both Democrats, but they are very different candidates. They do have very different stances on issues. I think you could, it's easy to say that uh, Kucinich is, is further to the left than Cordray. Cordray's more of a moderate. And they do have these sticking points that, that can, can really come between them. So how are undecided Democrats viewing these two candidates, Dan?
scale at this point, would you say? Well, we don't know how the undecideds yeah. are. What we know is that the most recent poll that was taken has this neck and neck, uh, each tied, uh, yeah. actually, with 21 percent. And half undecided. Yeah. Uh, on, on paper, Rich Cordray ought to be winning this race by 20 points. He is smart. He's got raised a ton of money. He's got uh, the backing of the party establishment. The reason he's not, the reason this is right now tight uh, is two reasons. One, Rich can at times be a little boring on the stump, but mo more, more importantly, he is on the wrong side of what is the defining issue of this election cycle, and that is gun guns and gun reform. He will not come out against assault weapons, military-style assault weapons, even though he knows that there is no constitutionally protected right to own an assault weapon, and even though his own running mate has now publicly broken with him on, on this issue. And Dennis Kucinich, if you saw that clip, he's wearing the F on his lapel, proudly proclaiming that he got an F from the NRA. Yeah, you know, I've said on your show before, I think Kucinich is going to uh, be the Democrat nominee. I mean, the liberal base, young, uh, young progressives, Bernie Sanders types, loves Dennis Kucinich. Heck, Dave Matthews Band is going to headline an event for him next month. Is he attracting the young voters? To I, Matthews Band? I, I think, he, well, maybe our age. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but at the end of the day, uh, as Dale correctly said, Rich is doubling down on the Second Amendment and, uh, and, and gun rights. You know, he said, I have no apologies in the dispatch for it. How is Dave, if he is the nominee, Rich Cordray, how is David Pepper going to convince the Democrat base to turn against their deeply held beliefs against the Second Amendment and support Rich Cordray. Game over if he's the nominee. I think what we're also seeing right now, and you saw it in that clip, is that Rich Cordray had to abandon what he usually likes, which is more of a buttoned-up approach, trying not to uh, fly off the handle that much. And I think Kucinich got under his skin a little bit, and you saw you saw that in that editorial board meeting where he got a little more fired up than usual. Well, Dennis is taking him head-on on the gun issue, and, and Rich is... Uh, obviously calculating that by not calling for an assault weapons ban that he may still be able to gain the support of the NRA from whom he's always had an A rating. I personally think it's a mistake, uh, not just because the NRA has become a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party, and, and I don't think they're going to endorse a Democrat, but the other part of it is, as Jackie or somebody said here a minute ago, maybe it was Mike, to, to, to cut into DeWine's double-digit lead, which he has right now, you need an, an excited Democratic base, in th a real enthusiastic Democratic base, and I don't think you're going to get that as long as you're on the wrong side of the gun issue. Jackie, he, uh, Cordray brought up Cleveland's history under Dennis Kucinich. Now, he was only mayor for a couple of years, but Two. they did default on loans during his time. Is that a reminder to the Northeast Ohio Democrats that, you know, Dennis Kucinich isn't all this, you know, Rah, rah, liberal. They were, he has a past. So oh, to speak. oh, absolutely. And even more recent than that, he's had some things that are troubling to Democrats. He's, you know, supported President Trump and, and issued, you know, statements in support of some President Trump's moves. He spoke at CPAC. Uh, he uh, has, you know, reversed his position on abortion. Um, so, you know, there are, when I talk to Democrats who are, you know, supportive of Cordray, a big reason they're afraid of, of Dennis Kucinich is that, you know, while people may flock to him for his position on guns, those other positions are going to come back to haunt him in the general and are going to hurt him in, against, uh, you know, Mike DeWine, who's a very strong candidate. Do they go negative in ads soon? Does Richard Cordray go negative and highlight these clips well, in a negative ad? You just stole my final thought today. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if the polls remain close. <laughs> Yeah. then yes. I think Cordray, who's got a huge war chest, I think he starts to spend it. Uh, and let's face it, Dennis Kucinich, with his sometimes wacky comments, his defense of Trump, his cozying up to dictators like Assad and, and, and others, he's a target-rich environment in himself. So, uh, yes, I think there's a very good chance that there may be that kind of attack. All right. Mike DeWine and Mary Taylor got as close as they likely will come to a debate this week. They sat down together with the Plain Dealer editorial board. It was a fairly civil affair, no name calling, no chance of lock her up as they made their pitch to conservative voters. As I'm traveling again and talking to, at least in this case, Republican primary voters, they're, they're looking for a true conservative who not only campaigns and says they're a conservative, um, but when they govern and, and when they're asked to make important decisions, is somebody that is willing to stand up for those conservative values. Can I just say something about this? This is about the eighth time she's talked about that the lieutenant governor says she's the true conservative in, in, in this race. And, and I would just say to primary voters uh, who, are, who are watching this, one of us has been a conservative who's done things. Uh, the other has been a conservative who has 
if like she says she's conservative, who has not really done things. Andy Chalo, that was about as fiery as it got. It was, yeah. for all the nastiness in this campaign, it was a pretty low-key affair. <laughs> he seemed like he really wanted to unload, and then he just kind of held back a little yeah. bit there. I mean, that kind of echoes one of the uh, commercials that's come out from DeWine's Super PAC. Um, yeah, I, I think the thing that we saw in that editorial board meeting was that it's Mary Taylor did a good job at laying out the issues and how she would approach those issues, the, the, the tactics she would take in addressing those things. And uh, DeWine kind of took the 500-foot view of it, but not really nailing down what he would do on one issue or another. And I think that kind of proves uh, why they might not want to get into a debate. He doesn't want to get into these things right now. Uh, and so, and that's why I think Mary Taylor's been trying to get a debate because it would be interesting to hear those two really go at it on specific issues. So Mike, who is the real conservative? Mary Taylor or Mike DeWine? Uh, well, I think Mike DeWine has the proven track record of conservative principles, beliefs, and, and, and results. Um, I'm not saying Mary's liberal, of course. I'm not saying that. No one should, or nor could they. But Mary's been a bomb thrower at best during this campaign because she's starving for media attention. She knows the only way she's going to be able to try Try to make up a 30-point deficit, which she has right now, is to do some outlandish things. I mean, she's trashed the Ohio Republican Party. She's trashed Ohio Right to Life. Anyone that endorses Mike DeWine gets trashed by Mary Taylor. It's unfortunate and sad, but at the end of the day, Mike DeWine will be the nominee of the Republican Party. I think that the question uh, isn't whether Mike DeWine is going to win the primary. He almost certainly will. The question is whether Mary Taylor is going to push him, how far Mary Taylor can push him into Trump's corner, uh, and whether uh, Mike DeWine will be able to separate himself enough from Trump in the general election uh, to overcome, uh, to not have his current lead that he's got in the polls overcome by the big blue wave that is building not just in Ohio but all over the nation. Jackie, and DeWine successfully did that in this session, and he did not attend Donald Trump's rally a week or so ago in, in Cleveland. He's kind of you know, not giving him the stiff arm, but basically ignoring Do Donald Trump and, and the noise that goes along with that. Yeah, I mean, he's having to toe a, a, a pretty thin line there because, uh, you know, Mary Taylor has very forcefully aligned herself with, with Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, the DeWine Houston campaign, we have to include, you know, John Houston in this as well. He has appeared at some of those events, mm -hmm. to be fair. And um, it, I think that this editorial board meeting was really great because it kind of cleared some of that, you know, who's with Trump, who's not, because does that really matter at the end of the day? To some voters, it probably does, but I think people are more interested on the actual candidate and what they stand for. And it is unfortunate, I think, for Republican voters that they're not going to get to see mm -hmm. Mary and Mike next to each other debating the issues ever. <laughs> this was it, really. And and I think it showed that debates are important when to you know when you're considering who to vote for because it is an opportunity for candidates to defend themselves and you know also uh, pitch their ideas for you know what they want to do when they're in office. Like some far right conservatives and Republicans in Ohio have always been a little skeptical about Mike DeWine. He co compromised with, with Democrats when he was in the Senate, and mm -hmm. uh, you see the signs out there as you drive out. You used to see signs as you drove out to uh, east on uh, west on the 70. Will Donald Trump supporters vote for Mike DeWine with enthusiasm? I, I think so. I believe so. When you look at the alternative, Dennis Kucinich or Richard Cordray, whoever wins there, or Mike DeWine, I think the decision's easy if you're a conservative or a Donald Trump supporter at the end of the day, because John Houston brings a lot to the ticket, too, that could help fill some gaps that Mike may have with Donald Trump supporters. But but I think the key is, is even Bob Paduchik, the number two at the RNC, has come out and strongly supported and signaled to Trump supporters in Ohio that DeWine is our guy. Let's get behind him and let's support him to win. Mike DeWine bought a, is buying a million dollars worth of TV ads, Dale. It's a positive ad. It's narrated by his wife, very different from the negative ads that he was out with a couple weeks ago. Why, why is he spending a million dollars now if he has a 30-point lead? Because he wants to win big, and he, does, he doesn't want to take a chance on having that lead narrowed. Uh, frankly, I don't think he's any, in any great danger. But this is not a bad time. I mean, he, you know, Mike DeWine, uh, uh, it's not a bad time for him to start tell, giving people positive reasons to vote for him. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that this is aimed as much toward the general in the fall as it is the primary. He's going to win the primary. And yeah, I think this is trying to trying to get that last wave into the primary to carry him into the general. So more of a positive message to kind of boost the numbers and then ride into the general with more momentum. The question you ask about uh, getting Donald Trump supporters, I think the interesting thing is I don't think he's going to be out there trying to get Donald Trump supporters. And I wonder if that's going to sort of muffle the support in November. All comes down to 
all comes down to President Trump and how enthusiastic Republicans are to vote at all. So right. turnout, turnout, turnout. Mm -hmm. Governor Kasich has found a Republican to carry his gun regulations bill to the state legislature. State Rep. Michael Henney from the Dayton area this week introduced the governor's package of six changes. Henney and the governor call them sensible changes, among them a ban on bump stocks, banning third-party or straw-man gun purchases, tougher rules to keep guns away from domestic abusers, and a so-called red flag law, which would allow authorities to take guns away from people in danger of committing violence. Dale Butlin, he has a Republican who has introduced this bill. What are the chances now that the Republican-led legislature will pass it in its entirety? Yeah, so I don't think very good. Um, look, especially compared with the new gun law that was just passed and signed into law in Florida, which had always been a, a very strong NRA state in the past. This had age limits. That was the big thing down there. Yeah, uh, but I mean, this is further than they've ever gone by far. This package introduced by Governor Kasich, with the possible exception of the red flag, is is so tame and, and non-controversial, it's hard to believe anybody could disagree with it. But I think that the Ohio General Assembly, which is in the pocket of the NRA, uh, is going to find reasons not to go for it. Despite the fact that a Baldwin-Wallace poll just out last week showed that by margins ra ranging from 60 percent to 90 percent, Ohioans are in favor of a lot stronger things like universal background checks with no gun show loopholes, uh, a, 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 a ban on, or a limitation, I should say, on high-capacity magazines, banning assault weapons. And yet, despite those poll results, as long as what's become the National Rifle, Handgun, and Lawn Bazooka Association, as long as they're in control <laughs> with these legislators in their pocket, nothing's going to change. Ken, well, I mean, Kasich has, you know, he's changed his tune on this a bit, Mike. Will lawmakers follow? No. Uh, they won't. The standalone legislation isn't going anywhere. Notice it was introduced by a term limited legislator who doesn't have a political future. Um, even if the Speaker of the House got every single Democrat, there's not a lot of them, there's only 33 of a 99 member body, even if he got every single one of them to vote for the bill, he still wouldn't get to 50, which you need 50 votes to pass the House. And I, I'm telling you right now, there are a number of the 33 Democrats that won't vote for it because they oppose it too. Look, the red flag uh, legislation that Dale talked about, that will get in an amendment in a bill that'll get to the governor's desk for the end of the year. But the package as a whole won't pass. Now, Jackie, the red flag one seems to me to be the most troublesome because you are taking away someone's right to have a gun. The other one is, the other ones, as Dale mentioned, are just sort of strengthening laws that are already in the book somewhere on the federal level and on the, on the state level. Right. Most of the four out of the six proposals that Kasich endorsed were actually making a state law that mirrors federal law. So that basically gives local law enforcement the ability to, you know, enforce those those restrictions instead of federal agents who are busy doing lots of things. Um, yeah, the, the red flag bell is interesting that that has piqued the interest of both Senate President Larry Abhoff and House Speaker Cliff Rosenberger. Um, it's been only passed in six or seven states. Uh, in neighboring Indiana is one of them, though, and that is, you know, led by Republicans, and they seem to have had no problems there. That bill there actually stemmed from a police officer that was killed. Mm -hmm. um, so the the issue with, and the NRA, I believe, has also said that, hey, we're, we're not opposed to that idea as well. So that, I think, makes it more palatable. There's a due process element to it. Mm -hmm. It requires, uh, you know, to go before a court to show, uh, you know, clear and convincing evidence, I believe, is the standard. Uh, so, you know, it's not just allowing people to take away guns willy-nilly. There has to be a lot to, to back it up. But I think if we see anything passed, it'll be extremely watered down from what was introduced this week. And it won't be until after the election. Mm -hmm. It'll be one of those lame duck, late night, maybe yeah. tack it onto a Christmas tree and, you know, ship it off to the governor by, by the end of the month. We're going to have to order pizza because it's going to be 11 <laughs> o'clock at night. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so. I That's think, early. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it'll be like a 3 a.m. situation. Right. There's a couple of tough sells here, and I think the first one is it's an election year, so I don't think anything's, anything's going to move. Uh, the other thing is that th there are a ton of provisions into one bill, and I think it's hard to get get people to jump on board. I think the one thing, if we're going to see anything when it comes to what what the governor's calling common sense gun legislation, I don't think we're going to see anything uh, pass as far as regulations go, but I also don't think we're going to see anything pass as far as uh, getting rid of gun control. So, for example, there's a stand your ground bill that was going somewhere and now all of a sudden it's stalled. So I think those bills are not going to go anywhere. Dale, you mentioned those poll numbers. when they, They've been pretty consistent over the years that mm -hmm. people support those things you mentioned, but it's never been a voting issue. Uh, t t for Democrats. Will it be a voting issue in the general? It might be in the primary, but will it be a voting issue for Democrats in the general election 
gun control. I certainly hope so. You know, we're in a situation now, and everybody should understand this. Since 1968, more Americans have been killed by guns than have been killed in all the wars this country has fought put together. So we obviously have a problem here. And unless and until voters who, who believe in common sense gun reform are willing to become single issue voters, at least for a cycle or two, like many of the NRA people are, because remember, yeah. there's only 5 million NRA members in a country of 320 million people. Until we become single issue voters, nothing's going to change. All right, we've got to get to our final off the record parting shots. Mike Undakis, you're up first. Mike, the world's gone mad. According to the Washington Post this week, liberal United States Senator Sherrod Brown supports President Trump's uh, tariffs, uh, his opposition to uh, NAFTA, and he wa wants him to continue to hit the gas while conservative Rob Portman and conservative John Kasich opposed President Trump. What, what is a man to do? Cats and dogs. Cats and together. dogs. <laughs> Dale. Yeah, so as I said earlier, I think that if the polls stay close, I think Cordray probably goes on the attack against Kucinich. I'm betting that uh, Cordray is going to win that primary, but it could be a Pyrrhic victory if it ends up splitting the Democratic Party at a time uh, when it needs all the unity it can get to beat the Republicans in the fall. Andy. Look for the legislature to maybe start working on payday lending reform again, but the people who want better reform say that the new suggestions are watering everything down. And Jackie. Just a PSA that Monday is the last day to register to vote or to update your address, and you can do both of those things online through the Secretary of State's website until 11.59 p.m. On Monday. Monday. All right, I don't know what's next for John Kasich, presidency, cable TV, talk show host, but comedy might be a possibility. He was on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me this week, he'll, which will air in Columbus Saturday morning at 11 on 89.7 NPR News. John Kasich was funny, and he was a good sport, and he was well-received by the crowd at the Palace Theater. So check it out uh, Saturday morning at 11 on 89.7 NPR News. That's it for the Columbus on the Record this week. Check us out online, Twitter, Facebook, our website, where you can watch every episode on demand. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.